I did not expect presence of Iran and, and Hezbollah to be as extensive as I'm, I'm pretty sure I've, I've come to conclude it is. Really? Hidden, but uh, well-rooted, well-established, well-entrenched uh, uh, with the political systems, uh, and as you said, extremely sophisticated the way it operates. So that was, that was a surprise. A view of Latin America that is somehow similar to what the Soviet Union mm. thought uh, in, you know, during the Cold War. Um, it, it is, or was, uh, or used to be the U.S. Uh, sphere of influence. The U.S. is our enemy. We need to um, snatch it away from the U.S. And uh, despite the fact that we are Islamic in our worldview, we're also revolutionaries and we can export the revolution precisely in in a, in a region that is so overwhelmingly Christian and Catholic, uh, at least nominally, because the roots of anti-Americanism are still uh, well, you know, well planted, they're alive and well, and we have a chance. And I think that that's what they've been doing for the last four decades, yeah, with some measure of success. With some yeah, measure yeah. of success. Farmud, America, Shaitan, Bozorgas. Welcome to the Border Wars Podcast. We're the number one podcast in all the Americas, the only bilingual podcast that takes you beyond the border. Now, I say we're the number one podcast, not because of me, but because of our guests. And we've got a very special guest with us today, Emmanuel Otolenghi. I'm going to introduce him in a second, but Emmanuel, how's it going? Long time. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you for having me over. No, absolutely. It's a pleasure. I've been wanting to get you on the podcast for a while, but it's like we don't record these all the time. We actually record them sporadically. This is now season two. We did, I think, 20 episodes season one, so we're now getting getting the groove back for season two. So I think this will be probably like our third, we'll see when this comes out, third or fourth episode for season two. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Awesome. So Emmanuel has a lengthy bio. I'm going to post his bio to, uh, from uh, the Foundation Defense of Democracy, the think tank in which he works at. He's a senior fellow. Uh, you publish a lot of books, but I, I'm going to kind of like discard the official bio and just kind of know, like, you know, we've known each other for a long time. And Emmanuel, this is like what I really love about Emmanuel, because you're meticulous with the facts. You're a researcher at its core. You're not looking at just a blind analysis or biased analysis. You really want to see the data. You want to see where the data takes you. And you've been looking at Hezbollah on Iran, Hezbollah's illicit financial networks, Iran's sanctions evasion networks. Um, you've been following the money, but you've been also following the, the terrorists. Uh, and so that brought you over to Latin America. But before we go into Latin America, tell us a little bit about where you began, because I think you're Italian. I think you worked in Brussels. Uh, I think you've done stuff in Israel. Uh, you, uh, so give us a little bit about your background on- Absolutely, Catherine. thank you. So I I'm, was born in Italy. I, I had my undergraduate education there. I did uh, uh, then go to Israel and did a PhD there in uh, political theory of all things. Oh, nice. Uh, okay. It had nothing to do with what my life eventually uh, became. Um, I moved on to academia, uh, taught seven years uh, at the Middle East Center and the uh, Center for Jewish Studies uh, at Oxford University. Oh, in London. Okay. In, in England. And uh, um, after seven years of teaching, although I love teaching, I wanted to move into a more um, active, impactful field that could combine Research. You were teaching Middle East? I was right? teaching Israel, oh, Israel. Uh, history, politics, a little bit of Middle East. Uh, but I wanted to do something else that could combine my academic skills with, with policy um, oriented uh, work. And an opportunity came out uh, to go and run a small uh, think tank in <coughs> Brussels, uh, the capital okay. of the European Union capital of Belgium, of course, but um, chiefly the environment there is a sort of a smaller version of Washington. Yeah. Uh, think tanks, lobbying, <coughs> parliament, uh, institutions, NATO as well. Mm -hmm. So I went to Brussels and I ran um, an outfit called the Transatlantic Institute oh, for three and a half years. Okay. You, so you didn't found that, you, you no, asked to run no, it? No, no, it had been established uh, about two years prior okay. to my my tenure, uh, and uh, there was, uh, um, you know, a desire by the founders to 
use it both as a as a as an advocacy mm. uh, group, but also that the advocacy would be or should be backed by solid research. Uh, yeah. Research. So like a think and a do and tank. So it was a both a think and a do tank, and uh, of course, being transatlantic, the idea was to. Uh, focus on transatlantic relations and, and sort of work in foreign policy areas where uh, the two sides of the Atlantic were, um, whether they were in agreement or disagreement, but to ensure that bridges could be built, okay. cooperation uh, could be enhanced and fostered. And because I had a, a you know, background in Middle East uh, um, uh, issues, I sort of dived mostly into what it's time just, frame is this? this so is, I started in September 2006, which okay, was kind yeah. of a, um, uh, you know, it turned out to be a, a fateful coincidence yeah. for my for my uh, career trajectory because at that time, um, you basically had the U.S. join the um, European three countries okay. plus Russia and China <clears throat> in leading negotiations with Iran over its nuclear program. And also in that time frame between you know late 2005 and late 2006, you had the you know the issue of Iran's nuclear uh, violations was deferred to uh, the was referred to the um, um, international from the International Atomic Energy Agency to yeah. the United Nations Security Council. So it became you know, an issue, a very sort of hot issue of international security. You also had the Sunni awakening where you're starting to realize that the Shias were uprising in Iran. Of course, Iran, I mean, it was, Iraq, you know, yeah. you, you also had that sort of broader environment of Sunni awakening in Iraq. It was the aftermath of the of the Iraq war and, and all of the, uh, the heartache that yeah. followed and the, you know, mistaken policies. And, uh, and also there was a residue, of course, of disagreement and tensions between European uh, leaders and the U.S. It was uh, the twilight of the, the last two years of the Bush administration. Uh, you had uh, you were at the tail end of the Second Intifada. Um, I started uh, my job in Brussels the summer after uh, Israel and Lebanon and Hezbollah That's had right. their, their, yeah. their last big, that was in 2006 big, uh, as well, right? Yeah. Summer 2006. So there were a lot of yeah. issues on the plate. You were busy. And it was busy. <laughs> yeah. um, and I did not immediately focus on Iran alone. I focused on all of these issues. But Iran eventually became uh, a fairly large part of my portfolio. But what really sort of draw, drew me into um, the kind of research that has kind of become my, my tradecraft uh, since then uh, was, again, happenstance. I was contacted by uh, a newspaper, a European newspaper, in the summer of 2007, and they wanted to write, uh, they wanted a column on Iran's blatant human rights violations. Okay. So I agreed to write it, I started doing my little background research, and it occurred to me, and at the time you, you had photogra graphic photographs of mm. executions um, published in the Iranian papers mm. on, a, on a regular basis. And the photographs that I started finding showed that the cranes from which these poor fellows were being hanged were all Western made. Okay. So, you know, it doesn't mean that of course, uh, whoever sells cranes to, to, to Iran is complicit in, in, uh, in the death penalty of innocent people, but it certainly sort of provided some color and it made yeah. me think, um, could it be that uh, this is an avenue for, for research to mm. look into what, Western companies are, are selling That's interesting because I think and a lot of people when they th that work in that field, right, the human rights field, they don't think of the financial and logistical networks that it requires to do like gross human, human yeah. rights violations. They look yeah. at more the the victim perspective, right? The human Absolutely. And that, of course, came later when, you know, since the you know, repression of uh, protesters in Iran uh, picked up momentum in 2009, and then you started seeing human rights sanctions uh, against the police. Uh, you immediately started seeing the financial angles. Of, yeah, of this. yeah, 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 yeah. And and so like a that kind of a detective opened up, yeah, yeah, opened up uh, um, my space for research, uh, looking at um, economic, trade, commercial relations between Europe and Iran, mm. and that eventually led to the to the production of my my first book, which was sort of a case for European sanctions. Now you have to remember at this time. Uh, you had UN sanctions, which the international community had to adhere to, and the United States wanted more sanctions. The Europeans were not in disagreement uh, on the sort of the principle, but they were maybe in disagreement on 
what to target, um, how to structure it, uh, the, the timeline for sanctions. But eventually in the three years that I was in that position, their, uh, their policy outlook on sanctions converged. Mm. And of course it, it kind of peaked <clears throat> in 2010 when first a very strong United Nations Security Council resolution passed broad sanctions against Iran. <clears throat> and on top of that, of course, the United States and the Europeans uh, piled up their yeah. own autonomous sanctions. Those are mostly sanctions. for the nuclear. Yeah. yeah. And so, so this was, of course, focused on the nuclear, although you also had the human rights angle and, and other angles. And <clears throat> my research kind of helped, uh, in a way, identify areas of vulnerability. And it kind of became a niche yeah. uh, within the, the sort of sanction research and Iran nuclear policy research, because of course the Iranians were just as aware of their vulnerabilities of course, yeah. as their adversaries. And so they, be, they of course built on the strength of uh, by then three decades of evading U S sanctions uh, to find creative ways where they could procure their technology, they could sell their products. And, and so it, it really became a full-time job to go after sanction evasion networks, mm. how they move the money, how they move the merchandise, how but they mostly create Iran it. at this point, right? Mostly Iran, yeah. IRGC, yeah. yeah, and and eventually in 2015, um, while Iran and the world powers were in the final stages of negotiating what then became the Iran nuclear deal, the, the joint uh, comprehensive plan of action or JCPOA, my. <clears throat> My colleagues, uh, at that, at the, by then I had moved to the Foundation for Defense of Democracy, continued to do When did you, you make that move? How long were you at 2010. The 2010, okay, 2010 okay, I okay. moved to FTD. Um, I s did that for a couple of years from Brussels, and then I moved to the States. And so my colleagues approached me and said, look, you know, you've looked at these networks in Europe, in the Middle East, in Turkey, in Central Asia, um, all the way to the Far East. But what about Latin America? You, have, you know, you, you've you've documented procurement of European technology, U.S. technology. And I, have you seen a little bit of Latin America? Right, and I, I had paid only scant attention yeah. to Latin America. I was aware, of course, you know, the the, the, the various Iranian footprint because of the Amia bombing and yeah. the attack on the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires. Um, I knew that there was some activity presence, but it was kind of a blind spot. Yeah, um, for many, I didn't, for many. I, yeah, yeah, and I didn't give it much attention. It, Latin America was not my field of research. Uh, uh, I've traveled a couple of times to Latin America by then, but really not part of my yeah. landscape. So they said, why don't you look at Latin America? And I said, you know, I don't know the region. I don't speak the language, <laughs> but... I'd be surprised if uh, it was such a big focus of procurement. Yeah. Why don't we look more broadly at all the things they're doing yeah. there? Uh, give me six months, allow me to study Spanish and uh, to you know get acquainted yeah. with- And that's the, when we met around that's that when time. when we met. Yeah. Sort of, I, I, I reached out to you because you were one of the few, very few experts yeah. in the area and I wanted to sort of get you some You know guidance. what I loved about that? Because at the time, because Latin America, if-, if the illicit financial procurement networks of Iran were kind of a niche among the kind of Iran analyst community. Latin America was like a super niche. It was like a fringe niche. And what I loved about that was like, okay, now they're going to stop saying that I'm a conspiracy theorist because someone else is going to be looking at this at a serious way. Cause there were other people that were looking at it, but not very serious. And a lot of it was alarmist. A lot of it was exaggerated. A lot of it was, and, and I'm not, you know, Iran's doing enough bad things. You don't really need to exaggerate uh, the threat. But I almost felt like in some ways, Iran itself would would push a certain uh, analysis that would create a simplistic or even sometimes a non-nuanced uh, analysis of what they're doing in Latin America. You know, that it's just about like is radical Islamist terrorism or something like that. And they wouldn't talk about the sophistication of which Iran, did. and you knew that because you already looked at the networks. So I was real pleased. And I was like, okay, finally, someone, someone that's someone serious, is doing that's an it. academic, yeah. that's an analyst is going to look at this. And, and you did. And I want to ask you this question because I've been wanting to ask you this for a long time. So you, I remember that time. Was that 2015? That was, Correct. And, and that was when Nisman died, right? That was when yes. Got, yeah. So that yeah, was like- Just a few months after yeah, Nisman died, you know, I started uh, looking yeah, at this That was crazy. Um, okay. So from that point on, you know, you started to come to Latin America, you start to learn the language, you start traveling. I think that was the first thing I told you. I said like, go down there, like go down there because like you can't really read about anything. There's nothing to read about. There's not many people to meet here. From now, you've done that for eight years, maybe nine years now, almost a decade. 
I, I, what do you see? Like, what, where, did, where did this go that you expected? And where did this go that was like completely not expected? It was completely shocking. Like, I can't believe they're doing this much. Uh, and where did it not meet your expectations? Right. So the first thing I want to say is um, I absolutely fell in love with, with the region. Um, <laughs> it's a nice region. <laughs> it, it's, it's so beautiful. Um, and as a, as a Southern European, yeah. I also found myself culturally um, more at ease yeah. there. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of the, both the dark and bright sides of those societies and the, sort of the, the idiosyncrasies and the cultural uh, quirks. Yeah, the norms and stuff. And the yeah. norms, I, I found myself uh, uh, more familiar with them than I ever felt here in the United States, mm. despite the fact that this is a Western country. Um, you know, part of the Western world, part of the NATO alliance, all of that. But I found myself uh, a lot more connected and overwhelmed by by the beauty, uh, the natural beauty, and and also the the historical patrimony that you encounter yeah. there. The you know, the, and how you was know. the language? Because I mean, you knew Italian, so that's I not- knew Italian, so it was fairly easy to yeah. learn Spanish. I I can't say I mastered it, but I get I get I, by. I don't master it. So yeah. <laughs> I feel like um, you're either born with it, and then you just get good at it. But yeah. I always mess up, especially on interviews, TV, and that. Yeah, kind of no, it's it's hard, and um, and and it, it is a foreign language, no matter how close it is to what you know. Um, fascinating, by the way, to discover how how different uh, Spanish is from one country to another. Oh, yeah. You know, in terms of um, expressions, idioms, and and also the the sort of local cultural influence. You know, I spent a lot of time in Paraguay. Every third and word is Guarani. And that's a different Spanish. That's a um, different type of Spanish. When you go to Chile, is it's a different experience. Argentina, I find it easier than other okay. places, at least in Buenos Aires, because there is so much influence from Italian. Um, the Caribbean and Central America, I, I need a translator usually. <laughs> <laughs> so it really depends. Yeah. But overall, that was the first impression that stayed with me. Uh, what a beautiful continent, yeah. uh, what amazing people, what great culture, what great history, what great food, what mm -hmm. great you know weather, yeah. whatever, just, just beauty all around. And also the contrast with the beauty is the darker sides, right? Yeah. The, the violence, the degradation, the... Um, corruption, the corruption, the inequality, the poverty, all of the things that, you know, you might expect to encounter um, in certain parts of Africa or, or in some parts of Asia. But for some reason, you look at Latin America, you think, well, this is part of kind of the European sure, yeah. um, Western uh, historical tradition. Um, and, and yet, uh, you do see things that are they're quite shocking. And of course, it's been very painful to watch uh, so many places in, in the continent get worse since mm. I started uh, going down there. So that's the first you know, thing. That's, I didn't think about it. It has gotten a lot worse since yeah. 2015. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing, yeah. 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 And not everywhere and not everything, but mostly. But overall, mostly yeah. Mostly overall. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing uh, was that I did not expect um, the presence of Iran and, and Hezbollah to be as extensive as I'm, I'm pretty sure I've, I've come to conclude it is, um, a lot more, and very uh, hidden, right? Very, very hidden, but, uh, well-rooted, well-established, well-entrenched, um, uh, uh, with the political systems, uh, and as you said, extremely sophisticated in the way it operates. So that was that was a surprise. The third surprise was, of course, um, the extent to which people were willing to talk to you, <laughs> officials, uh, members of civil society, and the extent to which, uh, and I've learned that the hard way sometimes, they are actually doing it and volunteering information, including, you know, government documents and so on to manipulate you. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, one of the things I've learned is to absolutely distrust yeah. uh, whoever I talk to, but at the same time to seek them out. Again you still have again, to talk to people. Yeah. Because you need to talk to people, no. but also because, you know, even if they're giving you something to somehow manipulate you or they're hoping to get some gains. You from, could get a lead you do get a lead and you do get useful information. And, no, that's a hundred percent. Yeah. That's a hundred percent. Yeah. And, and sort of it reinforced my uh, conviction that the only way to 
stay afloat in this field of research is that at the end of the day, you got to be true to the facts, you, yeah. you know, because you're going to be constantly in the midst of hidden agendas and, uh, and turf wars between officials and governments and people, even the ones who look friendly to you and who are providing solid uh, uh, evidence information, you need to go and verify independently for yourself and you need to be able to stand by your own facts. That's a, that's a great point. I want to jump on that point a little bit because I think that's a great point. I think that's for any of the researchers that are looking or listening out there. Um, you know, you think Latin American, I, I think I might characterize this wrong, but, but I'm going to go ahead. So, you know, you work at, I also started in the Middle East, right? As a military, but nonetheless, I didn't have Latin America as part of my professional portfolio until a little bit later. And when you look at the Middle East and you see the complexities there, culturally, linguistically, demographically, historically, and you're like, okay, Latin America should be a cakewalk, right? This, that's a real difficult region. And then you go to Latin America, that's, that should be relatively simple. It's, you know, my parents are from Latin America, so I should be able to, but then you realize it's a whole different level of difficult. It's not like, you know, in the Middle East, you could bomb things and, you know, just they forget about it the next week. Latin America, they're still whining about the bombings that happened in the 1950s and 60s. So Latin America is in many ways, I call it like a region of strategic deception. Like la, la, certain and elements in within Latin America are just, it's almost like a sport to just be able to trick in, 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 I, in Spanish, I was saying, engañar al gringo. And I just like make the American believe whatever you want him to believe. And, and, and part of it's because the United States has, has not played that game very well and has kind of come to Latin America with kind of just like a very transactional approach and say like, we need this, give me this, give me that. And so like Latin America is like very, very good at giving you what you need. Like you want this, I'll give you this, you know? But you don't always know why. Why are you giving it to me? Correct. For what reason, for what purpose? And Iran, and I would say China, Russia as well, but namely Iran, really good at playing that game. Really good at playing that that kind of double game and, and getting a sense of who's who in Latin America and in kind of the consistency and the persistency of their network, which I think to some level has been able to penetrate many of these uh, greatest examples counterterrorism. Right. So Iran said, okay, we're considered a, a terrorist threat to the West, to the United States, to Israel, to, to the Europe, Europeans, and Latin Americans don't really know anything about that. So why don't we just penetrate all the counterterrorism networks in uh, Latin America? And so anytime that they investigate terrorism, they're going to say, uh, you know, they'll tell the United States, yes, Iran's here, Iran's doing whatever. But in reality, they're going to help us understand what the United States is looking for and what the United States is looking at. And I, I learned that lesson too, uh, kind of early on. And I think that that's an important lesson because it's not that Latin America is a, uh, an easy region to, to study or understand. And I think there's a misnomer that it is, that it's it's relatively easy in foreign policy. And I just never felt that was. No, you're right. And I don't know if this sort of the deceptive element there is that, you know, most of, of Latin America, aside from Brazil, um, speak Spanish, right? So yeah. you, you kind of see a commonality and, and maybe we're, you know, negatively influenced by the... Um, the anti-imperialist anti <laughs> yeah. uh, Pan-Americanism of, you know, the likes of Che Guevara and yeah. so on. And then, but the truth is that, as you know, the countries uh, have very little in common aside, um, aside the language. Yeah. Uh, and even you said, even the Spanish isn't really the same. The Spanish like, is not the same. When I go same. to Paraguay, I don't always understand what they're telling me because the Guarani is thick uh, in absolutely. Paraguay. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, but again, sort of, you know, I'm not so sure that, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the northern side of Latin America, of, of South America, the Caribbean nations, um, have so much in common with a place like Chile, for example. <laughs> yeah. So, so th there are uh, profound differences. And when you look at the continent as a whole, you sometimes lose sight of, of that. And there are similarities, by the way. There are similarities in the fact that you do have, and I guess some of it is the the legacy of, of, uh, of Iberian colonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you do have a culture of corruption. You still do have high indexes of poverty in the, in the, in across the region. You do have, um, vast inequalities. Uh, you do have power somewhat concentrated, uh, in the hands of a few. You do have, um, um, the center of the country, uh, being the capital, mm -hmm. Uh, in most countries where everything's there, industry, services, yeah, like mega power, yeah. uh, finance, uh, and so on. And, and sort of as you move away from the deceptive calm, relative calm or, or opulence of the capital city uh, into the provinces, you start seeing 
you know, the state yeah. vanishing and the borders are porous because, you know, far away from the capital, um, there is, you know, it's pretty much uh, a different world. So you do see those commonalities. You do see, you know, the the impact of, of um, or the wounds that each of these countries has from its past of, of civil war or or military coups, and you see it in in the legislation, in the constitutions, and you see it in in the, the the public culture. You see it in the still fairly radicalized or or polarized. Uh, political environment of some of these societies. And, and then of course you see uh, how vulnerable these countries are still, um, all of them, to the um, challenge that comes from organized crime. Yeah. Something that yeah. is spreading like wildfire, um, even in places where it wasn't really a reality uh, until a few years ago. I mean, you're starting to concern about places like Uruguay, mm. um, or Costa Rica, where um, you know these were little islands yeah, of, of tourism. relative uh, mm -hmm. tourism, um, offshore finance, um, but essentially moderate political systems that resemble more, you know, Western Europe, United States in terms of stability, in terms of moderation, in terms of uh, you know um, um, relative prosperity of the country, stability, you know, lack of lack of. Uh, um, traumatic experiences like say, you know, civil war in El Salvador or in the, you know, the dictatorship in Argentina these, or Chile, these things. So you're starting to see the, those, um, those networks, uh, those hybrid threat networks penetrating even in countries that traditionally did not experience that same level of violence and displacement and division. So that's uh, also something that is, is puzzling uh, yeah. because, you know, how, how do you square the circle? All of these differences yet, all of these uh, shared shared elements, but I think that the one thing that I told, I took away from initially, you know, speaking to you and the other handful of of uh, band of brothers, I guess, mm. that, that deal with uh, Iran in Latin America, and then later on observing it um, from uh, up close and personal, is that Iran uh, has a view of Latin America that is somehow similar to what the Soviet Union uh, mm. thought. Uh, in you know during the cold war um it, it is or was uh, or used to be the u.s uh, sphere of influence the u.s is our enemy we need to um snatch it away from the u.s and uh, despite the fact that we are islamic in our worldview we're also revolutionaries and we can export the revolution precisely in you know in a, in a region that is so overwhelmingly christian and Catholic, uh, at least nominally, because the roots of anti-Americanism are still um, well, you know, well planted, and they're alive and well, and we have a chance. And I think that that's what they've been doing for the last four decades, yeah, with invested. some measure of success. With some yeah, measure of yeah. success. No, I agree. I agree. I think they 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 made an investment early on. So I said, let's see how this you know, pans out. Um, and I think there was no coincidence that they started in the South South of South America, because that really was where the anti-American was always the strongest historically in the region. I mean, Argentina, you know, I love Argentina, I love its food, I love its people, but you know, they do have a more European approach, uh, to their culture, to their history than, than United States. And so they've always been considered kind of like a, the most anti-US country in, in, in Latin America. And I think Iran, you know, figured that out really quick and said, we're going to feed this a little bit, incentivize I, it. I agree. Let, I agree. Let, let it grow. I agree. You know? But I, I got to tell you something. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in my research, I at some point found <clears throat> an obscure academic article written by um, um, a, uh, an Islamic scholar, Western, um, who sort of goes down to um, Brazil, um, and I think also to, to the Southern Cone, and comes back and then sort of reports on the state of Islam uh, in that part of the world. And this is an article that was published at the beginning of the 1980s. Okay. So- Right in the beginning. Just in the beginning, right after the Islamic revolution in Iran, but not, not at, a, at a time when Iran had already sort of launched its ambitious project there. And what the professor essentially says is that, you know, these communities exist, but they are, you know, they're struggling to maintain their identity. They don't have books, they don't have clerics, they don't have uh, institutions. Uh, and 
you know, give them the institutions, the clerics, the books, and they will, you know, there will be an Islamic revival. That's mm -hmm. what Iran essentially did. And I am sure that Argentina uh, loomed large in their plans. But I also think that there was an opening there because there was a community. Yeah. And it did not have a cleric. Mm. And what better way as a cover to send somebody to be the spiritual shepherd yeah. uh, of the flock. Yeah. And, and here is one of the sort of similarities uh, of, of um, modus operandi between Hezbollah and Iran. Of course, there are two, two components of the same phenomenon, but you know, they operate, uh, they manage different departments, let's say. But one thing they have in common is that initially Hezbollah did the same. They said, uh, you know, we are going to take over. There are expatriate Lebanese communities all yeah. over the world. And wherever we find a community that has this sort of critical mass to sustain their own set of institutions, not just a few scattered families, but, you know, a mosque, a school, a youth movement, um, a library, um, maybe a hospital, maybe... Uh, you know, um, uh, an Islamic charity for the poor, for the elder, and so on, we are going to take over those institutions. And they did. They did, yeah. They did. And so they started where communities were already there. No, that's that's a good point. I, I agree. Uh, obviously, I saw the same thing. And it, it was lack of infrastructure that was there for those communities that in, really they were, they were not ostracized, I would say, because some of them had uh, affluence, economic affluence because of their, their businesses, but they weren't necessarily integrated into the broader community of whatever country that they resided in. And um, the, a lot of them maintain traditions from the Middle East. They maintain re religious traditions, cultural traditions, um, and there wasn't any real infrastructure for them in those countries. So Iran said, like, look, We'll put out the infrastructure. Here we are. Sunni yeah. Shia really doesn't matter in that sense. They're just going to put out the infrastructure, uh, as they say, build it, and we will come, and they will come, and they did. And then as it evolved, really, it wasn't just that those communities it branched out to other disenfranchised communities, indigenous communities, um, former um, youth networks, uh, women, uh, whatever they could find that they felt that had a little bit of lacking identity. And, I, and I'll share with you because I, I, one of the you know one of these guys that runs one of these or used to run one of these Islamic uh, Shia Islamic centers that you know proliferate in Latin America, financed by Iran. He said something to me once, and, he, and it was interesting. He said. Um, because he considered himself a Christian Muslim. <laughs> I was like, hey. I said, that's interesting. <laughs> that's an uh, interesting one. We see a lot of weird things in Latin America with that. You see like- yeah, a, a lot of syncretism. Sunni yeah. Shia. You know, yeah, like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I used to know someone in Brazil that would go to the Sunni mosque in the morning and then the Shia mosque in the night. I was like, just for the free food, I get it, <laughs> whatever. But this guy, I said, you know, he was a former communist. He was, you know, part of the, the Maoist Marxist uh, networks in Peru. And he then went, became part of the kind of the Iranian Islamic uh, networks down there. And I asked him, I said, why, what made you kind of go into that world? And he said that he felt that the communists lacked faith. Mm -hmm. The communists lacked having a real conviction in their beliefs, that they had an end state, they had a goal, but when push came to shove, they would sell out. And the Islamic, the Iranians don't. Like they have this conviction that's deep core because it's tied to a faith. Um, and so I remember that stuck with me because I said that that is an attractive quality for someone that already has like a revolutionary background and uh absolutely i you know i i, I haven't met him personally but uh you know the director of one of the iranian centers in in europe mm -hmm. um i'm not going to mention yeah. the name or the country but uh is uh, is a gentleman who started his career as a journalist in the 1980s um broadcasting in his own mother tongue from Prague mm. in the communist propaganda radio that was yeah. the counterpoint to Radio Free Europe. Uh, so this person starts as a, as a hardcore communist in the mid 1980s, works in Prague for the Soviet Union essentially, and then communism collapses. Um, where does he go? He goes to Khomeini. Yeah. Um, and I think that the Iranians are banking on that very much. They are sort of Obviously, they're very good at calibrating their message depending on their audience. You know, in, in Western Europe, what we're seeing, for example, is that they reach out a lot to, to the extreme far right. Yeah, yeah. The message is completely different, right? Is we are your allies in defense of traditional values. values yeah, yeah. Right. But in Latin America, they see more potential in recruitment. The left. The left. Anti-imperialism. Anti-imperialism. And so the message is basically that 
Imam Hussein, mm. the symbol of, you know, of Shia uh, um, uh, struggle and uh, sort of the, the, the prototype of the martyr and the, the sort of the, the, the savior, uh, and almost like a messiah, messianic role in, in Shia iconography. Imam Hussein is an Islamic Che Guevara, essentially. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how they market well, uh, the message. And it juxtaposes with kind of uh, indigenous cosmovision in the sense they always believe in the resurrection of a previous leader that's going to come back. You know, the Correct. Tupac Atari, Tupac Amaru, the, 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 you know, the I will die and there'll be a million more uh, followers. And so it was an I saw them do that and it was an attractive message. Uh, I thought many Latin Americans were, as you mentioned, the, the fall of communism left them kind of all scattered and, and not without any real uh, place to go or identity to follow. And uh, and I think Iran capitalized uh, uh, 100% Absolutely. on that. Uh, Absolutely. And they're also sort of able to fudge the, the more controversial or less appealing aspects of, of their message or of their mm -hmm. package, right? To say, well, you know, we are, you know, we are fighting the same fight. Besides, I mean, it is part of the message of the Islamic revolution. This was sort of theorized by um, not just Khomeini, but, uh, you know, just to think of another person, uh, Ali Shariati, mm -hmm. you know, the great uh, intellectual ideologue uh, uh, who blended Marxism and, and uh, Shia Islamic revolutionary fervor. The idea that, you know, the essence of the revolution is to fight for the oppressed. And yeah. There's nothing religious, uh, intrinsically religious in this message. is a message that can be latched on to many causes and that can appeal. And, and over time, I think what we've seen in, in Latin America and perhaps in other places of the world, um, you know, as you know better than I do, the Iranians started by sending their clerics and then establishing their cultural centers and taking over the mosques and trying to convert people and bringing them over to Iran, turning them into trained, uh, you know, translators, clerics, uh, advocates. And sort of once they're recruited, they become the foot soldiers and force multipliers in their own countries. But what we've been seeing in the last few years, and I think that this is a relatively recent phenomenon, is that they're branching out of that environment. They're going into universities, for example. Yeah, yeah. and to politics. And to politics. Yeah. And... And I think that, again, this is not just random. It's the realization that universities may not be necessarily a ground for proselytism in the religious sense. The students may not be converted to Islam uh, or not immediately, but they can be recruited to the cause yeah. through the radical ideology indoctrination, of yeah. and indoctrination of anti-imperialism, anti-Americanism, you know, the resistance to... Western arrogance, all of those slogans, which again resonate in Latin America because they have predecessor, you know, precursors in in during the Cold War and you know the era of fighting, whether it was against the dictatorship or colonialism, they they do echo in that environment. They're not thoughts and principles and ideas that are alien. Oh, that's a hundred percent. So I was in I was in Colombia. I was in Bogota not too long ago. Oh, I've been back and forth for a while now. And uh, there's a there's a couple there's a few universities there that are very radical and they always have radical youth networks. We saw them in in the protest in 2021, the Primera Línea, that crowd. And uh, there's a university in Bogota, um, um, Universidad Nacional is the big one, but there's another smaller university called uh, Politecnica. And um, you know you know I find a way to against the advice of some of my uh, 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 researchers down there, I found my way inside one of those places. They say you shouldn't go in because you know they've actually kidnapped people in those universities and the police don't go in there because uh, they're almost like it's an ELN for kind of recruiting ground. And I saw uh, murals of Soleimani. There you go, <laughs> there you go. Like, and I was like, well, and this is obviously after the death of, of Qasim Soleimani after 2020. Yeah. And, and I was like, these guys have no freaking clue who Soleimani is, right? No, but I mean, the Iranians have been very good at, at marketing Soleimani yeah. as sort of a, a later day Che Guevara, yeah. a later day, um, you know. You wrote a great piece, I think it was in Tablet Magazine, yes. about this. Yeah. And yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I think it was right around the time I was in the university. Okay, so they, like, they established a, a, a center in, yeah. in Caracas yeah. at the Universidad Bolivariana de Venezuela uh, that is called Catedra Libre. Qasem Soleimani, yeah. right? And, uh, Soleimani seminars. <laughs> correct. And um, when Raisi was in Caracas uh, last June, um, they produced uh, 
posters mm. that students showed at uh, at the university events where um, that Raisi attended, where they had combined uh, Fidel Castro, um, uh, Che Guevara, Julian Assange, Hugo Chavez, and Qasem Soleimani. So. Yeah. The sort of the iconography is, yeah. you know, all of these guys. What do all of these characters have in common? Do they are they all? They're not all Muslims. Yeah. They hate the United States. They're, they all hate the United States. They're all revolutionaries, and so they're all firebrand icons for that kind of message. And it doesn't matter uh, if you're Muslim or not Muslims. You can still make Qasem Soleimani as a later day Che Guevara as a symbol of resistance yeah. and defiance. And and that's what they're doing. And they're doing it very well. Yeah, and I think that's an undervalued aspect from, from some, you know, you, you spend a lot of time also briefing with government officials and defense intelligence officials, as do I. And I feel like they undervalued this. They undervalued that, that like, okay, you know, that's like, you know, a little thing here, a little thing there. And I was like, but it adds, it adds up. And and the thing is the multiplying effect. One time, one of these, uh, one of these briefings, a defense official asked me, he said, well, Joseph, said, like, do you think it'll ever actually, you know, have a mass conversions into Islam? And I said, you know what, you know, you're not seeing it now. There's an effort. What would it take? And just kind of off the top of my head, I said, famine. You know? Like when people are hungry, they'll they'll convert to whatever they have yeah. to convert to. And and a country like a Venezuela, right, where the, it's right up there with Haiti in levels of famine and in, in, in food insecurity. And, and I think food insecurity is now becoming a bigger problem in Africa and Latin America, uh, particularly after the Ukraine war. I mean, this could be a big, a big kind of net that could be established for for Iran to. Con- I don't want to say mass conversions; that might be a little bit too far, but, but at least to move the needle further than they have in the last. You know, for sure, years. for sure, and you know they. When you sort of when you look at their conversion model, again, I I think it's sort of it's a page taken out of the, um, the uh, the playbook of. Um, Revolutionary Marxist Leninism. Yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, they're looking to bring to build uh, an elite vanguard of leaders, bourgeoisie. Yeah. They vet them very uh, slowly. They're patient. They don't take anyone in, just anyone. Um, they want people who are going to be committed, who are true believers, and who can rise uh, to positions of leadership. Um, but they're certainly pushing for countries to align to Iran, to open up to Iran. And again, they've been remarkably successful. But to to the broader point you were making, I I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, maybe the reason I look at these things so much is because, as I told you, I I started my my academic career studying political theory. I do believe that ideas matter matter a lot. Um, You know, we we can spend a lot of time studying methods of deception and how they do this and how they do that and how they move the money and how they launder it. And, but we never understand their motivation, uh, what drives them until we look at the ideas that justify their actions. So, so let let me, let me stick with this. Um, so the big, the big kind of network, right. That, that was known and exposed publicly, mostly through the work of Alberto Nisman, uh, you know, the late Alberto Nisman, special prosecutor Argentina for the AMI attack, was the Rabani network, right? Um, um, now that's had, you know, evolutions and anamorphosis since then. And there's other folks that are doing that similar work, but he was really kind of like the great, the, the, God, the godfather of, of this in, in terms of Latin America. Um, did you see that Rabani network becoming uh, sort of a element that could be used for warfare, or did you see it more as an element that could be used just for proselytizing, or is that kind of one of the same? So, when it's a great question, uh, when I when I talk about these networks, um, I usually address them in the framework of um, indoctrination, recruitment, and radicalization, because that's what they're doing. They're not just um, you know offering a spiritual alternative. Um, to you know, Catholicism or evangelical Christianity or or something else, they are turning their followers into militants. Yeah. Um, and while <clears throat> I doubt that Iran would uh, turn these converts into you know 
active agents of terror plots. And I'm not saying that they wouldn't want to volunteer for it. They wouldn't be motivated to do it. it but I think it's a strategic. It's a, yeah, yeah, it's a strategic choice. And I mean, and just as a parenthesis, you also see it with the Lebanese expatriate communities. Yeah. They're not going to sort of recruit a Lebanese or descendant of a Lebanese family who lives in, say, Paraguay or Colombia, to carry out a terror attack. Why? Because they're part of. The they live there per per permanently, they're part of the community, they have family. There are so many reasons why it's not a good idea. Not because these people may not be motivated, but because the modus operandi is different. And for Iran, it's the same. That does not mean that these people can engage in uh, support yeah, activities. Uh, activities such as providing logistics, uh, logistical support, infrastructure, access, and they are also, you know, there to be ambassadors in a way for the idea, right? They open doors, they they establish contacts, they they pave the way for certain things. So they they have a role to play, um, and they may play that role, uh, you know, whether it's surveillance or again, sort of facilitating certain operations, the movement of people, the procurement of documents, whatever it is, yeah. without having to go all the way. You know, where, where I see that kind of uh, that 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 convergence or that that Venn diagram overlap is, um, I agree one hundred percent. Like, you, you don't want to, you know, use an asset that has been developed and cultivated over a long period of time for something that may be very uh, specific in terms of a terrorist attack or things like that of that nature. And and you know, Hezbollah has a network already that can carry out these attacks. They don't necessarily need to have a permanent presence in these countries to do so. But where I see that that network being utilized in terrorism is in the cover-ups, you know, like, cause a lot of these Hezbollah things never ever t turn into arrests or they turn into arrests, they don't turn into convictions and if they turn into convictions, they don't turn into permanent, like long-term sentences. And I feel like these networks are part of that corrosive corrupting influences that are penetrating the institutions in the country. So when, that's why I always felt like Rabani's method wasn't just to carry out a terrorist attack in 1994, two of them, what was to get away with it uh, and to have a level of impunity with it where pretty much the courts, the police, everybody was just blinded and no one knew what to do or how to investigate this. Uh, and then you had a prosecutor that, that that was pursuing this and then he ended up getting killed. So I felt like that is, is where that little bit dovetails. And I'll give you one little thing about Peru because I, you know, the, you know, you know, I followed the Hamdar case very, very much. And what you said is, you know, very pointed to that because one of the first things that came out uh, caught my attention when Hamdar arrived in Peru in 2013 um, was that you know he, here you got a Lebanese uh, individual um, that does not speak Spanish, uh, that got married, but his wife left, um, that doesn't know a whole lot of people in Lima. And he has a, a Shia Islamic center, like not far from where he's living. And he doesn't visit it once. So that, that's a level of compartmentalization that I thought was very clear to me, all right? Because like anyone, like if I go to, I don't know, like, you know, uh, India and I see in, like, an American school that speaks English, I'm going to at least ask for directions. Where do I go? Where are the good restaurants? Of course. How do I get there? You know, how do I, you know, find anything? And I, I noticed that he was being very specific uh, to avoid this uh, because I think that was a compartment, a different line of effort, right? The Islamic centers, the stuff that was coming from Mustafa is like, we don't want to yeah, contaminate and, that. And, and, you know, because of their at least sort of public face, mm. um, they're very exposed, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, th th their activities reach out to the public constantly, even though we don't know necessarily what happens there all the time, but it, it's there is an exposure there that makes them vulnerable if they were to participate in, in those types of activities. So I think there is a, a conscious decision to separate these two things and yes, to leverage members of the loyal uh, followers, whether it is the Lebanese Shia community when it comes to Hezbollah or the converts when it comes to the Iranian centers, uh, leverage them for a variety of things, but not for that. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump a little bit forward because I, I do want to talk to you, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna save Hezbollah for another conversation because I feel like that's a whole conversation sure. in and of itself. It is. Um, but we're gonna jump to the IRGC because this incident that happened that you know everyone uh, that's in this space started talking about and looking at. And I know you looked at it. I've looked at it. But is the plane right that arrived in Argentina, Buenos Aires uh, last year? And I thought that was, you know, for many people, it was kind of like a novel thing. For me and you, it's uh, more of the same, you know, as what Iran's been doing for a long time. They got caught this time. Uh, uh, but describe to us how you saw this uh, operation, both how it was thwarted to some level, uh, how it was then covered up to another level, 
And then what was your takeaway from that whole incident of the IRGC? Because it was when just Argentina, they flew to Chile, they flew to Paraguay, they flew to Mexico, they, flew, they were coming from Venezuela, so. Right, so first of all, what was novel about it? So here we are in 2022, um, um, Iran transfers an old <clears throat> cargo aircraft, a Boeing 747-300. So it's, it's one of those rare um, Boeing 747 that has, you know, the, the nose opens up. Yeah, there's not but, that many of them yeah, in the world. Yeah. There are not many in the world. Uh, so it can be used very in a versatile way because it can be used as cargo, it can be used as passenger. Um, and but it's an old plane. Yeah. If I, think I they remember Ron got it from France, is that right? Or say it again. Where did Ron get it from? Because they bought it. They from got somewhere. it from France, but they yeah. got it from France. Uh, if I if Long I if, you, if maybe France, yeah. But we're talking about twenty years yeah. before, yeah. if not more. So the plane is already um, 37, 35, 37 years old, and because it's been in the fleet of Mahanair mm -hmm. under U.S. sanctions um, for terrorism. And before, so once you move to the Iranian fleet under U.S. sanctions in general, mm -hmm. since forever and a yeah. day, the aircraft uh, does not really have uh, maintenance. The kind of maintenance <laughs> and certification. Uh, to not be, the kind of flight to, you want to take. <laughs> That's not the kind of flight you want to take. It's not airworthy. And, and, um, and so that's the first, uh, the first thing that happens. Uh, Iran provides the plane to Venezuela. It's not the only plane that Iran provides to Venezuela. There is an agreement that Iran would transfer six planes to Venezuela eventually, and I believe that they did transfer most of them. Venezuela currently is, is uh, operating um, three yeah. uh, fairly, fairly modern Airbus Air A340, which Iran procured surreptitiously through an Iraqi cutout in 2015, they used to belong to Virgin Atlantic, um, and uh, and so now they are in the Venezuelan fleet. But this cargo is something else. I mean, those planes are ostensibly used for passenger travel. This one is cargo, and so that's the first thing. The second thing, of course, is as you very well know, because you were already watching it when it happened the first time around. Um, you know, we use the term Euro terror, <laughs> el, el, el terror. Uh, Aereo yeah. of of Iran and, and Venezuela because Cumbiasa was flying between Caracas and Tehran between 2007 and 2010, but then they stopped. And then they resumed in 2020, it was Mahanir, then Cumbiasa. We don't need to go into the details, but basically the only bridgehead Iran had in, in Latin America up to that point, certainly for cargo, transport, aircraft, was Venezuela. Venezuela, yeah. Right. The Bolivarian regime, mm -hmm. they're like, like landing you know, strip for them. Yeah, yeah, they're like, you know, Cuba to Russia, to the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s. That's what they are. Everything else is, you know, up for grabs, but so far contained. And suddenly this aircraft arrives and it starts flying around the continent. <clears throat> and it carries around uh, the kind of merchandise that just does not, logically jive with the type of business supposedly and ostensibly they're doing, right? Because it's, car it's parts just, they're, you know, it's not just what they're moving because in the case of the flight to Buenos Aires, they were bringing spare parts of, uh, for the car industry, yeah. I believe for a Volkswagen, Volkswagen assembly yeah. plant in near outside Buenos Aires. It's not so much the, the merchandise is that the value of the cargo yeah. is less than the, the cost fuel for of the flight. <laughs> correct. Now, the, yeah. of course, the Venezuelans say, well, you know, our, our, our fuel is so subsidized that the company uh, can actually or make a profit. We got to pay the pilots and you yeah, got to pay the crew. But, but they're going to fly empty yeah. on the way yeah. back. No, no one does right? that. Yeah. And no one does that. The other thing is that every time they stopped, um, they stopped on the ground for lengthy amounts of time. And I mean, we're not talking weeks, but we're talking nights, yeah. right? So when they stopped in Ciudad del Este, they stayed for That was irregular, because that didn't- That was a one-off yeah. and it was a very strange uh, occurrence. It happened in mid-May of 2022. And that's that's when I became aware of it because somebody leaked it to the press yeah. and the press started talking about it because the plane was picking up cigarettes for the former president yeah. Horacio Cartes and it was during the primaries for the Colorado party. So those opposed to Cartes candidates used it as a way to attack Cartes. So the news came out. And, and so that was the second anomaly. Why are they flying 
uh, and sort of stopping over for so long, especially since this was a plane flying from, from Caracas to Ciudad del Este, not a long flight that sort of requires the crew to spend the night at least mm -hmm. on the ground to rest. Um, Uh, and then sort of they flew to Aruba, which is yeah. pretty much the same distance. So it made Suriname no sense, too, right? Yeah, yeah, it made no sense. The, the third thing that made no sense, why are there so many people on board? <laughs> like 16 right? or... <laughs> so in, in Ciudad del Este it was 18. Yeah. In, uh, in uh, Buenos Aires it was 19. And at the same 19. time that these flights are happening, you have two more things to factor into the story. One, Conviasa with the other planes it bought uh, from Iran is flying to a variety of um, Latin American destinations that yeah. it didn't used to fly to. Buenos Aires, Santiago, Lima. Um, Mexico. Among, Mexico City, among others. And some of the people who are flying the cargo plane at other times sort of are members of the crew of these other aircraft. Mm -hmm. So so there is that thing uh, that is happening. And... Um, And then you look at the identity of the pilot, of the pilot and of the rest of the crew. Yeah. And you quickly discover that um, the Iranian side is basically either IRGC, senior commanders and officers, or uh, members, uh, employees of Mahanair, an, an airline that has been, that is sort of linked to the IRGC has run up military operations for the IRGC. Yeah. Um, it's a shuttle transport for it's the It's a IRGC. shuttle transfer for, for, it was a shuttle transfer yeah. for the troops yeah, uh, to Syria, yeah. and militias to Syria during the, the, the height of the civil war. So, so there's that. And then on the Venezuelan side, as you know better than I do, the people who are on board also mostly were uh, military intelligence yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so on. So uh, plus, you know, the, one of the people who was in the crew detained in Buenos Aires was the CFO of the plane. What is the CFO <laughs> on the plane doing yeah. uh, on such a flight? So there was a lot of strange stuff. And so the second, the second part, of course, is that suddenly, instead of just flying Iran, Venezuela, Venezuela, Iran, they're flying all over the place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're extending their, their reach through the commercial operation and the cargo operation. And I think that because of a string of fortuitous uh, yeah. uh, circumstances and coincidence, the plane got grounded. Yeah. Um, and once it got grounded, it kind of spooked everybody in the region. Um, and regardless of the reluctance of authorities to do anything or to intervene or to, in sorry, to intervene the wrong way or to belatedly intervene. But the bottom line is that the plane got grounded. Still crew, grounded. Still grounded, still there. The crew detained. The United States issued uh, a warrant for seizure of the plane. So th the likelihood that Iran and Venezuela will be able to use it again for anything mm. is close to nil. And the other flights also got grounded because yeah. while you're, you know very well that Conviasa still flies to Mexico, still flies to Lima, obviously to Cuba, um, but... Buenos Aires and Santiago de Chile with the other two important destinations got, yeah. got canceled, canceled and yeah. they're, they're not coming there anymore because they're terrified that those more modern long distance planes will also be grounded. So I think there's, there's something to be said despite the criticism that we can probably voice uh, to government authorities yeah, yeah, in Argentina yeah. and other places that at the end of the day, this was, this was a good thing. And, and I thought, I thought it was actually a great use case for the effectiveness of sanctions because, you know, there's always criticism of sanctions and sanctions aren't strategy and you, you, they can be overused. Sanctions do become overused. But uh, if that plane, if those airlines, Mahan Air and Koviasa were not sanctioned, this would be a lot weaker case uh, to Correct. be able to do. And I, I thought the use case on the sanctions was very interesting because it wasn't necessarily just the planes. It was all the service providers to the planes, which as you know, a, a plane needs uh, food, it needs fuel, it needs uh, stewardess, it needs, yep. needs a bunch of stuff. And once people got the message that if you service this plane, you are subject to not just sanctions, but you could be actually be indicted and criminally prosecuted as well. People were like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm not in it for that. You know, this is- Absolutely. If you turn me that, you pay me to turn a blind eye, I'll turn a blind eye, but you pay me to put my livelihood and my uh, life at risk and they won't do that. And I thought that, that that was an effective use of US sanctions 
enforcement sanctions, which sometimes we sanction things, but we don't enforce the sanction. And Iran's kind of been be able sure. to maneuver through that. For so sure. I thought that was a great case. I, I agree. I think it sent a strong message. Unfortunately, like everything, you know, kind of goes by the wayside and, you know, time's never on your side on those things. And, and you know, the cargo left, which I don't know if that was important, the passengers left. I thought that was a big missed opportunity because there was enough there. I thought that you can actually persecute uh, some type of charges uh, on on these individuals, especially the pilots. True, but, true. It's it's possible that the evidence was there or or is there, but on the other hand, um, you know, I, I look at it. I look at the glass half full rather yeah, than half yeah, empty, yeah, and yeah. I, I recognize that it could have. My been, glasses, your no, glasses no. are full. My glasses <laughs> um, No, no, but I recognize you're right. Uh, that there is definitely more that could have been done, but let let's consider the circumstances. The government, the present government in Argentina, not exactly yeah. keen to go after yeah, Iran, yeah. right? Yeah. We knew that. Well, that was we knew that, surprise. right. First thing. Second thing, the reason why the plane essentially gets grounded in Buenos Aires is absolutely fortuitous, right? <laughs> They're sort of flying in from Caracas yeah. to Iraq, actually yeah. Ciudad de Mexico, yeah. uh, to, to Buenos Aires to drop their cargo. And they encounter uh, bad weather, bad weather. Yeah. and they're diverted two hours to, uh, yeah. uh, to no to Cordova first. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they go to they go yeah. to Cordova. When they get they to land Cordova, in Cordova, they yeah. land in Cordova. Yeah. They wait for the storm to pass. Yeah. And it was never clear that they actually offloaded in Cor Cordova. They did not. Yeah. They did not. I mean, there are photographs yeah. showing sort of the, with, the, with yeah. the door open. They're probably just getting some fresh air, but I don't think that they got off the plane. Yeah. Then they um, fly back to Buenos Aires and they still haven't refueled. So mm -hmm. those two hours up and down, four hours more of, of flying, essentially doomed the plane to be stuck there. Because they can't get back to Venezuela. Correct. With the had, one, one. had it not been for the fog yeah. uh, and the bad weather, they would have gotten to Buenos Aires. And not to mention there was someone in the Americas. So the president of Argentina was in Los Angeles. Correct. It Correct. was like a bunch so, of circumstances. So, so, yeah. so had it not been for that, they would have landed, they would have dropped their cargo. They might've done whatever it is that they wanted to do there. And they would have been able to fly out with enough fuel to get to Venezuela without having to, to, to make a stopover. Once they have that diversion and there is no refueling op option, then they're essentially stuck because yeah. I mean, granted, I mean the Uruguayans could have chosen not to play ball. Yeah, they could have chosen to let them land and refuel, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. And at that point, um, they're stuck. So that's the first, uh, the first thing. The second thing is that the three months that they were um, detained in Buenos Aires, I don't know if the local authorities used those three months well or not well, mm -hmm. but they certainly got access to everything that was on board. Yeah. They got access to their um, electronics and they may have gotten access to their conversations if they bother to intercept them In the hotel, and, yeah. and follow them and so on. So even if we lost the opportunity to, you know, interrogate them, uh, investigate them, potentially indict them prosecute. and so on, prosecute them and so on, we did, we the local authorities and presumably they must have shared at least some with their counterparts got the opportunity to get a lot of information. Yeah, no, it was serendipitous for sure. I mean, I thought yeah. it was, you know, it was, I don't think any, and we, I knew the planes were moving around, but I, I didn't, I mean, I found out like everybody else that they, they grounded it in Buenos Aires. And I was like, oh, that, that's interesting. Cause I had become a more half glass empty type and thinking just, oh, they're just always gonna let these planes keep going. And like, you know, the origin government's not gonna do anything about it. Uh, but circumstances uh, played out differently. And, and I think that that, it served a great lesson in the use case for sanctions. Um, you know, I always had this kind of a uh, kind of sneaky suspicion because, you know, we follow Venezuela quite a bit and, you know, Iran's always been building out these, uh, um, basically these military transfers, military armament that they're building in Venezuela now transferring to Nicaragua and Bolivia. Um, and so they need procurement for all that stuff because it's no longer yeah. in Iran. It's also now in Latin America and those countries are sanctioned as well. Well, maybe not Bolivia, but in Nicaragua and Venezuela are. And it was always interesting because I, I was very suspicious of the Cordoba landing. And I agree, I didn't find any evidence to suggest that they actually offloaded or unloaded anything, the door opened, whatever. But Cordoba is a very strategic place to stop off. And, and in, in Mexico, uh, San Mexico City is actually uh, Querétaro, right? Yeah. And so you have two things. You have aviation industry and you have missile industry, both in those cities, in Querétaro and Cordoba. And I was, you know, there's just kind of those correlations as investigators. We always look at these yeah. correlations. We're like, is this just a correlation or is this something more? Uh, and so I was curious about that. Um, and I remember that was the Venezuelan airline Imtrasor, I think it was the, the airline, right? And like the, the origin of that airline was outfitted specifically to help 
procured stuff for the drone program. For sure, yeah. for sure. And I mean, when you when you look at the the flights that they logged uh, during the four months yeah. before the plane was grounded, uh, from the moment the plane was transferred to Iran, to to Venezuela until the moment it was grounded. I mean, they were not just flying uh, locally in Latin America. No. I mean, they have a lot of very strange, far away destinations and, you know, uh, including potentially, uh, you know, the, the, the tracker didn't follow them everywhere or all the time, but including potentially to Myanmar. Yeah, Myanmar, yeah. Um, Belarus, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So clearly this was um, a rogue, uh, you know, authoritarian regime's cargo plane, at yeah, the very yeah, least. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it, some people say that it's a minor achievement because it's it's an old plane. I mean, it, it uh, almost, it almost don't can't Don't tell that to Nicholas right? Monero. <laughs> he no, is but, pissed. But the point yeah. is that, you know, it shows actually that even when they do manage to put together such a logistical operation, they have to rely on some old yeah, plane yeah, falling yeah. apart. They don't have access to state of the art technology. And that's because of the sanctions. And yeah. and you're right about the story sort of showing how sanctions can work. Um, the reason why, you know, Kumbiasa manages to fly to uh, Iran and Moscow and back uh, transporting potentially technology uh, alongside passengers is because we're not enforcing sanctions yeah. because we could. Uh, yeah. There are things that could be done to enforce sanctions and, and bring those places to the ground safely, obviously. Yeah. Um, the fact that uh, Iranian oil tankers are, are reaching Venezuela and, and supplying, you know, the country with the largest reserves of oil in the world with, with gasoline it can't refine in defiance of sanctions, it's because we're not implementing the sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, now, you could also say, well, the sanctions are not working because they're meant to persuade these regimes to change course and they're not changing course. And that's a fair, that's a yeah, fair yeah. criticism of sanctions, but they are exacting a price. And the only reason why um, um, they're not as effective as they could is because we lack either the resources or the political will to enforce them to the fullest. No, I agree. And I agree. I think, I think yeah. you know, sanctions are a measure, I think, of uh, to some level. It's a coercive measure. I, I agree with that. But it's a coercive measure that can be used to inflect uh, consequences for uh, illicit behavior and illicit activity because, you know, old moral hazard, if you don't provide a consequence for bad behavior, you get more bad behavior. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, it's like saying, is is um, our traffic lights effective? Well, it, you know, if- <laughs> People if, run them all the time. Yeah. People run them all the time. But sort of in countries where, you know, if you run a red light, you go to court, you lose your license, you pay a, a steep fine, um, where consequences, people follow the rule yeah. because they fear the sanctions that come out of the not following the consequences. In countries where nobody enforces Any the rules. traffic light rule, then they're not effective. But That's it's, a great you know, <laughs> uh, analogy to kind of end on the Latin America, US. Because Absolutely. Some, one of the best, one of the, you know, the number one things I get from Latin Americans that come to the US is like, you guys follow the traffic laws here. And yeah. I was like, yeah, because you get a hefty fine, you get a suspended license, you get points, you your your insurance goes up. Your life just gets a little bit more difficult if you don't follow the traffic laws in, in the US. But in Latin America, a lot of the countries, they, the traffic laws are just there Absolutely. for- Absolutely, yeah, Absolutely. So that's and, and so, so that's, that's the point. The enforcement makes these rules effective and, um, and uh, consequential. Yeah. And One last question, Manuel. I don't yeah. get it. We're gonna get, so just for, okay, if you guys are new to the podcast, uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, hit a like on this uh, video, uh, share it with your colleagues. Uh, give me at least, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be modest, give me 500 likes and we'll have Emmanuel back. And we'll get, we'll get Emmanuel back. Cause we didn't even touch a, a big part of what his work has been, which is Hezbollah tri-border area. And, and I, you know, I'll say this now, but we'll get you back to talk about it, is you know, before you started doing the work on the tri-border area, uh, there hadn't been analysis on the tri-border since like 2002 or something, that it had been abandoned. There was some serious work that was done at, in the early years of the war on terror, so to speak, to look at the, and I think it was actually looking at Al-Qaeda and then they found out that Hezbollah right. was taking over. Right. Um, and, and then there was kind and of- And by the way, I was just there about a month ago, so oh, yeah, okay. I have stories to tell. Oh, we need to get you back soon. <laughs> we need to get you back soon. So um, with that teaser, um, we'll uh, get Emmanuel back. 
And one, I want to ask you one last question because uh, I we were kind of on the Iran footprint. What do you take about Iran in Bolivia and this recent uh, defense agreement that they just signed? Because if, you know Bolivia is another Venezuela in the making. Um, disturbing yeah. for a variety of reasons. The first reason is, of course, that this is a secret agreement, so we don't really know what's written in it. The little we know is perplexing. Um, Bolivia says that it's buying drones for. Um, to combat contraband smuggling and drug trafficking on the borders. On the borders. <laughs> um, I was under the impression that at least some segments of the Bolivian government were actually facilitating <laughs> all of those things. So I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh. The second reason is, of course, uh, what you mentioned in your recent articles, namely that uh, you know they're they're expanding their presence, uh, they're they're making their footprint more um, profound and, and strategic, and permanent. And permanent. And also, I think they're making uh, Bolivia, like they successfully made Venezuela, more dependent yeah. uh, on Iran. So, you know, again, go to Venezuela. If you think about how the, the relationship between Venezuela and Iran began under Chavez and Ahmadinejad, it was on the same level, right? They were equals. Um, Venezuela had something to give Iran, Iran had something to give Venezuela, yeah. but they were yeah. equal partners. Today, that relationship is completely lopsided yeah. in favor of Iran. And I think that with Bolivia, yeah. you have the same potential. So that was the second thing. The third thing, of course, is that uh, the way that the Minister of Defense, when sort of criticized uh, uh, and questioned by the Argentinians, responded. He yeah. essentially responded... Um, by using anti-Semitism. He yeah. said, oh, it's yeah. because some right-wing uh, uh, Jew or Israeli in the Argentinian government or parliament uh, criticized it. It's just dismissed it by character assassination, which adds to my concerns and suspicions that they have quite a bit to hide uh, yeah. in what is going on. And of course, I'm not a military expert. I don't understand uh, very well the implications of the specific technology that they they uh, they are transferring, but once again, those types of drones um, are not necessarily the kind of drones you would need Surveil, to uh, patrol the border. Yeah, no, no, no. And it's interesting. Uh, the defense minister Bolivia Novillo he said, uh, you know, because the Argentines a little late, but they eventually asked questions about what is this agreement. You know, they have the history with the army attack, and the and then the defense minister Bolivia said. Um, there's nothing signed that will threaten Argentina. It's like, what does that mean? Correct. <laughs> like, Correct. what is that? You did other things very, that didn't very, sign? Very ominous. Very yeah. ominous. And again, sort of, it, it sort of begs the question, you know, why does Bolivia need to pair up with Iran yeah. uh, for, you know, I understand the appeal of Iranian drones among uh, authoritarian states. Uh, they're accessible. They lack the restrictions that uh, mm. Western technology may there are no strings attached. They're cheaper. But um, there are other places to go shopping. Yeah. And uh, I and think it's showing more Bolivia where it's uh, setting its uh, geopolitical footprint. Saying, Absolutely. You know, we're we're going to be and a part sort of, of this. It, it brings us back to the worst days uh, of, of Evo Morales uh, yeah. in power. Absolutely. Well, uh, Manuel, thank you again. I know you got a hard stop. It was awesome to see you. Uh, thank you for thank all the you work. Thank you so much. You, no, thank you for My all pleasure. the work you do. Thank you. Uh, I definitely want to talk to you about the tri-border area in Hezbollah the next time you come back. We'll um, do. And there's a lot going on. New government in Paraguay. Just an New government in Paraguay. Yeah. And so hopefully we'll- But the tri-border stays the same. <laughs> it always stays the same. Yes. So that is. Um, okay. So next time, uh, like, subscribe, do all that things. Help us with the algorithm. And we'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Subscribe to the Border Wars podcast and visit our website at securefreesociety.org. See you in the next episode.